I was the guy that thought I lost my identity as a result of not having the position inside the pulpit or inside of a denomination. And now I'm able to share my testimony with anybody that I meet inside the business world. And I am quick to share what God has done for me because God's been so good to me. Welcome everyone to Seek, Go, Create. This is the raspy voiced Tim Winders coming to you. I'm an executive coach, but right now I sound like an, a late night FM disc jockey. I am just coming out of about 24 hours where I had no voice. So bear with us here. We've got a great conversation. This is where we redefine success in leadership, business, and in ministry. Great conversations. And we've got one today. I am going to be speaking with and having a conversation with Joshua Brown. He's the founder of Pressure Washing Pastor, a business that seeks to inspire and challenge people to start pressure washing companies in their cities. And he does that because he believes pressure washing can provide job opportunities, create disciples, and benefit the community. I agree with that. Joshua, welcome to Seek Go Create. Hey, thank you, Chan. Appreciate you having me on your show. I'm a huge fan. Been following you for about a year now, and I'm honored to be here. Thanks. How's my voice coming in? Is it doing okay for you? It's sexy. Sounds like you belong on a Star Wars film, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> All right, Joshua. Hey, let's get going. First question right out of the gate. Gave you a little bit of warning. We just bump into each other, and I say, Joshua, what do you do? What would be something you would typically tell people? I think I would say I'm a former vocational pastor turned minister in the marketplace and inviting others to do the same. How's that work? That sounds good. A lot of words there, but I'm... Yeah, I tried to simplify it. It's not easy. Background in ministry, doing work yeah. in the marketplace, and, uh, and you're combining both of those, correct? Yes, sir. My identity didn't change when I left the four walls of the church, I was the same person outside than I was inside. It took me a while to figure that out once I left vocational ministry. So one of the things that I like to do here, and that is maybe get people's attention right at the start. And I know we've got business people, we've got people in ministry, we've got people that are faith people. But you shared some numbers from your business with me when we had a brief conversation a while back. Yeah. And to me, that, that sort of grabbed me because a lot of people will talk about doing business and they can be kind of limping along and generating a little bit, but it's hobby ish. Can you give just quickly as we start the, I think you said revenue numbers is what you did, just the progression of your pressure washing business over the last yeah, few years. Sure. Yeah, I started the business after high school church camp. I was still full-time as a student pastor, campus pastor, and connections pastor at a church about five, 10 and 50. And when I got back from church camp, I played around with pressure washing. And then in 2017, I was like, you know what? I think I can do this. I stayed in ministry for the next three years, but my first full year, 2017, I did 225000 inside of pressure washing. The next year was around four fifty. $450,000. The next year was around 700 and plus thousand. And then the next almost a million dollars, about 900 or so. And so within four years, we almost hit a million dollars in pressure washing. And that was with me working full time inside of a church. Wow. Oh. So see, the reason I bring that up, and I'm sure you've run across this and we could be candid is a lot of people would think something like a pressure washing business. We use the word business, yeah. but sometimes it may be considered part-time. They do it on the side, which you were doing it on the side, but it sounds like you had two full-time gigs is what you really had. But I'm sure you've run into people that have said, I like the thought of pressure washing, but how much can you really make? Have you heard that? Yeah, I've heard that as well. And then I hear, since we're super candid, I've had folks see where I'm at now, pastors, 
and they say, the reason of your success is because you have so much money, marketing connections, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I was on a student pastor payroll for 20 years in ministry. I had at that time, four kids. My wife was a stay at home mom. And so I didn't have time. I didn't have money, but I did have a framework. And I feel like if we address the framework we're working with, we might be able to work with less time, less money and get things done. Yeah. I'm not going to ask you this. You might could share briefly, but it would be interesting to contrast the financial, the salary, the reward of the pressure washing business versus student pastoring. I'm sure that in 2017, the pressure washing business far surpassed what you were making as a student pastor. Would that be a correct statement? If I chose to utilize the profits for pay, that would be very correct. But I had a mindset of monopoly and I wanted to buy every piece of property, every street that I could. So I reinvested back in the business. And so because I had another side hustle or business working in a church, the side hustle, I just reinvested back in the business, but I could have made a very good living at that time. If I wanted to switch over doing 225, if you, there's just it only takes about two to three people to do two hundred and twenty five, two hundred fifty thousand dollars. It's only one truck now. Every truck we have does two fifty. Sure. I'm gonna ask one more general question and then we're gonna circle back and get some testimony. And then I think we're gonna wrap up with talking about your current business model and how that's working and what you're doing to I call it marketplace ministry, how you're getting out in the community, doing business, but also doing ministry. But in general, big question. And it's not a trick question. You can answer it however you want to. But there are many people that have this thought that you can only do ministry within the four walls of a church, very confined, very restricted. And then maybe there's some people that also say you could also be a missionary and go overseas and somewhere in Africa or something like that. As you have experienced this over the last handful of years, do you believe that you are any less of a minister because you are out, I'm trying not to guide the answer here, meeting with the public, interacting with people? I guess just contrast the two perceptions about ministry. Pressure washing, you're out, you're in the marketplace. Student ministry, you're working with students, obviously, in a, it, within a church setting most of the time. Talk about the observations of ministry for both of those. So I was one of those people, Tim, when we say- You were, you oh no. People? I was actually one of those people. And it wasn't something I spoke out loud, but it was a fundamental belief based on the way I operated ministry. I was one of the student pastors that gave the kids a hard time on Wednesday night if they didn't show up on Wednesday night. And I'd give them a call and I'd say, hey, where are you at? And I'd talk to their parents, the grandparents, say, hey, we'd love, I know sports are important, but so is renewing their minds. So is being a part of a community. I did not understand that if my real job was to equip them and send them to be inside the marketplace, inside of sports. And the sad truth is that whenever we're institutionalized, we think like the institution that we're and institutionalized in. And it's not until we step outside of the institution that our eyes are like, wait a minute, there is, for me, there is more ministry going on in my life today than ever in the past. I have, the local schools have picked me up and I go coach the coaches on creating healthy culture while they're teaching what they know. And so I teach the four different high schools coaches and about them coaching their athletes. I say, hey, you teach what you know, but you reproduce who you are. How healthy are you right now? And then how do we dig into your past, your father wounds, things that you had, unforgiveness, any stressors? That would have never happened if I'm at church Wednesday night. I was never set free to run. And I had people that were trying to speak into my life telling me, hey, Josh, I think you're meant to run wild. And I'm like, I didn't even understand what that meant. And so it took me a year and a half, Tim, of somebody in the secular world called the BBB. It was the largest gathering of seven-figure business owners in the country. They meet in Nashville. 
and a gentleman wanted to invest in my company. And I said, I don't need an investor. I need a good salesman. And he said, why don't you come and be a part of the BBB? I was like, is that the Better Business Bureau? He said, no, it stands for Bourbon, BS, and Business. And I didn't know a lot about bourbon, Nazarene background, still don't know a lot about bourbon. And I try not to BS a whole lot, and but I do want to learn about business. After six months of being there, you know what they ended up calling me? What's that? Get to guess. The pressure washing pastor. And when they called it, I'm like, why are y'all pegging me as a pressure washing pastor? I'm not in ministry anymore. I'm not a pastor. And so, Tim, I was the guy that thought I lost my identity as a result of not having the position inside the pulpit or inside of a denomination. And now I'm able to share my testimony with anybody that I meet inside the business world. And I am quick to share what God has done for me because God's been so good to me. And mm -hmm. so I never changed who I was, but I didn't know that I was still very much a shepherd that's called to, to guide, to protect, to lead. So anyway, so I was one of those guys, Tim. I think, and I've seen it too. I might've shared this with you. I've shared it with the audience before. I was saved in a business setting. So my paradigm, and I am not sure God can do all types of things. He can do anything. We know that. But I'd been in and out of churches all my life up to the age of about 27, 28. And someone would have asked me if I was a Christian. I would have said yes. But I was one of these chinos, Christian in name only. I wasn't mm -hmm. actually participating and had not really received that transformation of what Christ does for us when we're able to live out the follower of Christ. But my observation, I've gone to Bible school, I've been around ministry. I think that with the religious circles and with Bible schools, I think they're, a, they're training, and maybe they do it consciously, maybe it's not consciously. They're training people to think that the most worthy thing you could do is work in full-time ministry. And I'm not saying that's not worthy, but our conversation here is all about that is not the most worthy thing that one can do. There are plenty of other worthy things in God's kingdom, correct? Yeah. And if you have any listeners that are landing with that narrative, I would invite them to chew on a couple of conversations. First, what are the chances that you're utilizing a narrative that benefits your kingdom versus the kingdom of God. And there were times in ministry where I was a drug dealer, pothead, high school dropout, changed by the gospel, asked to be disciple. The next thing I'm in Bible school, the next thing you know, I'm a student pastor. Next thing you know, I'm on a roller coaster ride. And I felt like I was running and I love the church. We need the church. It, but I felt like I spent most of my time running programs, events, and trying to encourage giving and different financial programs for the local church and missing the beauty of what we can do to invite people. Well, hey, instead of planning a church, why don't you plan a business? I wish we would empower those who give their lives to Jesus to think more creatively than what's been done in the past. And there's a piece of scripture that I feel like God spoke to me about recently where Jesus is on the shore, he sees his disciples fishing with some nets, and they're not catching anything. And he says, hey, guys, throw your nets on the other side of the boat. And they throw their nets, and they pull up, and there's so many fish that they, the nets could barely even hold the gathering. And it's, if you look at what's going on in, in our country, maybe the most beautiful place that we could exit would be the church and head into the marketplace to be the church. Because I think we're called to be on mission, not just to be, hey, come and come to our church and, and serve inside of our programs and give to what I would call our kingdom. Yeah, that I love as I read through the Gospels and I try to use this. I'm not sure if I should make, I'm making more of it than I should, that Jesus chose his disciples and every one of them were marketplace, small business owners for the most part. There's a tax collector and a zealot and a few other things in the mix there, but most of them would have been categorized, I believe, more entrepreneurial, marketplace-type people today. Can I speak to that for a second? 
Sure. I went to Exponential, put up a booth called Pressure Washing Pastor. And Exponential is a massive church planning organization. And I was voted most interesting booth at Exponential. And I had people just staring at it from afar. And I'm beside the Red Letter Bible, which are phenomenal people. They write curriculum. I'm right beside the yeah. children's curriculum. And missionaries started coming up to me and saying, in our country, this is normal. It was only inside of our culture where it seems to be abnormal. And now that I've been sharing this pressure washing pastor ministry in the marketplace idea, I'm having other church leaders and pastors come up to me and say, I've been doing this for over 20 years. I feel like something's got to change. And they're thinking about their kids and their kids are wanting to do, make a difference, make disciples. But is, is the church the only place that we can make disciples? What if it was mm. inside the city? Yeah. I love it. That's what we're really attempting to get that message out here at Seek Go Create. Also, that to me is the ecclesia that we see in the early church where people are, they're working, they're ministering, they're bringing themselves together, they're supporting each other, they're helping each other. And I think that's the model that we need to look at. I think we've tried to segment things too much. I want to back up. And I want to hear, because every time I've talked to you, you have said, Tim, can I share my testimony? Tim, can I share my testimony? And I admire someone. I, people ask me mine, but I'm not, mm -hmm. because it does impact so many things related to my identity. I'm not as aggressive as you are, but I admire it. So let's back up, Joshua. And I appreciate that you're holding on to the words to the full name Joshua, by the way, because our you. son's name is Joshua. He's about to turn 30 years old and he's had to fight his entire life to keep people from calling him Josh. He says, I am Joshua. I am Joshua. And I think you've, sounds like you've done that, but back up, share wherever you want to start from. I've got some questions related to your testimony that I read through also, but let's go back and let's talk about, I, I call it, affectionately, Joshua, the early years, and let's see how you've gotten to this point. So what's on your heart? What do you want to share about that? Yeah, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. But my, the reason I want to share my testimony is because when I look back, I'm like, nothing happens without what God has done for my life. And so my mom adopted from Kalamazoo, Michigan, down to Nashville, Tennessee, behind Hooters and Waffle House, off of what's called Wade Circle. And some people have a good adoption story and some people not so much. My mom was not so much. Her dad would go to jail for the things that he was doing to her at 13. And her mom was addicted to pain medication and alcohol. By the time she's 15, she ends up getting pregnant by a 21-year-old named Frankie. Frankie said to my mom, I'll pay for his abortion, but I won't be in his life. My mom at 15 with nothing no support, no money, broke. Look at her so like nothing. She's got nothing. She ended up saying, I can't kill all this. And so the reason I like to talk about it is because I'm like, it's everything. And true to Frankie's words, he chose to not be in our lives when we grew up homeless and with different boyfriends. And my mom would marry two or three different times. We live in the back of soup kitchens, church fellowship halls, cars in different cities, different projects, and move from place to place. By the time I'm 17, I'm in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm a drug dealer, pothead, high school dropout, which makes sense. It looks like that was my pathway for where we were at. I had no dad figure except for Tupac, NWA, Snoop Dogg. Those were the guys that I looked up to, which I know you don't know anything about any of those individuals, but you're smiling, so maybe. And at 19, I ended up getting in a really bad car wreck. I was following a friend named Pookie. He had a 3000 GT still that was pearl white. And he ran a red, a yellow light and I ran a red light. We, and then there was a truck that ran a red light as well. And we met in the middle. From that moment, God started speaking to me. And you know what he said? He said, he didn't tell me I was going to hell. He didn't tell me that I'm a worthless piece of junk. He said, Joshua, I love you. That broke me. It moved me to give the pastor my pot and God my heart. And that was at 19 years old. I'm 46 today. And I'm, I went back to school, got a GED, pastoral ministry degree, Christian counseling. 
and uh, now a ministry in the marketplace. So that's a quick snapshot. Married 25 years this year, six kids, 21 down to one. So there's so many things there, Joshua, and I appreciate you sharing that. And one of the things that's interesting as someone who does these interviews, I always look for clips that grab people's attention that we sometimes put at the beginning of the podcast. I think I might've just gotten that clip, but we talk about redefining success here and often people can just make a decision and over the course of three years, five years, 10 years, whatever, they could redefine what success means to them. It sounds to me like there was what many would say is a catalytic event that occurred to you at 19. But the question I've got is, were there clues? You were alive was one of them, but were there other clues in your life between the time of your mother saying, I'm not going to take this life that's living inside of me to the time of being 19, where you could say, God was pursuing me. He had his hand on me as protection. And I know it was 24 seven. I know that, but I'm asking about awareness. Are there times that you're fully aware of God's hand and presence from that time of your mother to the time you were 19? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I would say the first time I was made aware of it is we were like, escaping from Nashville. There was a guy that my mom had lived with who was violent and evil. And I was probably about nine years old. And when we were in Alabama, I was invited to, the preacher was talking about giving God your heart, giving Jesus. And I looked at my mom and said, I need Jesus in my life. I went down and I felt an experience with God. And so I don't know theologically what you would say as far as when saved, always saved, or did I lose my salvation? But I know when I was nine years old, I felt like God loved me. And then as I look through the timeline, there's constant reminders. And inside of my head or heart, I knew the way that I should be living. I just wasn't living it. And it wasn't until that moment of the collision where God starts saying, Joshua, you're wasting your life. And so it was, there's many evidences. I gave you a brief testimony, but God's hand of grace, I think, is evident when we take time to pause and just look around us. Sure. Joshua, I think so many times, I think everybody's on a journey, by the way. And God, I felt like God spoke to me one time after some very challenging times that I had been through. And I felt like he said, Tim, there is nothing that is from your past that we will not use to advance God's king, my kingdom in the future. And I was like going, because I kept thinking maybe there was some wasted time or I wasted this away mm -hmm. or something like that. Obviously, your life segmented pre-19 years old, post-19 years old. But instead of, I think we could go through a lot of the negatives of your pre-19 year old self. But what are some of the benefits? This is asking to maybe shine a positive light on some rough situations. But what are some benefits that you still reap? from the pre 19 year old Joshua Brown? It's a good question. And it might take me a long time to process outside of the, when anybody asks me, how are you doing? I always answer with Dave Ramsey's answer better than I deserve. And it, one of the things I would say is that the awareness of who I was and God's love for me in the midst of those times and behaviors that that he chose to just love me. To me, that's the overarching awareness is that to those who much are forgiven, much is expected or much love. I feel the weight of his love as a result of the sin that, that I chose to engage in and those that did it, did unto me. And so if anything, I'd say it just makes me appreciate and love him more for loving someone like me. Yeah, I do think that. I like that word awareness. I think sometimes if people haven't experienced darkness, they don't understand light. 
if they haven't experienced hatred, they may not understand love. And that might be a deeper thing than we're trying to look at here. Are there any, this is not a counselor question, but I've recently interacted with some people. My wife is one that has experienced some things at a younger age. She has been transformed. She is a great woman of God. But there are some times that some of the things from her past will just kind of rear up, cause a few issues. Anything growing up that, and I think this is an important part of testimony too, by the way, because I know people deal with stuff. Anything from that pre-19-year-old Joshua that every once in a while you have to lay it before the altar again and again? I would say quickly, one, one thing that, that you mentioned is often as a result of what we experience, we attempt to be the very opposite that of. And so for me, not having a dad, I went through a Michael Hyatt teaching years ago and it had me create a life plan. And I wrote down at the end of my life, I want to be a godly man, husband, and father. So that's my purpose statement. You try to live a godly as a godly man, husband, and father, and then maybe let's take man out of it and just go husband and father. What I have recognized is that as a result of father wounds in my past, not having one and being taken advantage of, and then trying to give love both to my wife and my children, there is an unspoken expectation that I have that they will love me more as a result of me responding out of my father wound. But that's an incorrect assumption. It's, it's super incorrect because it really shows that I wear a mask of behaving in a certain way in order to get something back out of purely loving the person in front of you without any expectation from the person in front of you. And so to finish this life a godly man, husband, and father means that you love without any expectation of anything in return. And so I think that is the emotion. Like, and when we talk about emotion, I don't know if your listeners can resonate or if you can resonate. I get tore up when I love and that love is not returned. It's almost, I thought you would love me if I loved you. But sometimes you love and that love is not reciprocated. I think that father's love is the love without anything in return. And I feel like that's the father wound that I've experienced as a child that I've tried to mask myself to be a great husband, man, and father. But to be great means you love without expecting anything in return. I think it's difficult for most of us to grasp unconditional love that the father has for us. My wife and I had this discussion probably three months ago because of relationship she has with her father and her mother. I was praying for her and I was asking the Lord what I could do for her. And the Lord, I believe, spoke to me and said, she struggles more than most, more than I do, with understanding and accepting and receiving unconditional love. And to me, that's what I heard when you just said that. I didn't try to connect dots that don't need to be connected, did I? Unconditional love is tough for all of us to grasp, but I think it's even tougher when people have had issues with their earthly parents. We can go into a lot of conversations here because we can even get into doctrine and theology and how we're taught a certain way to believe and think that lends us to a place that might be bigger than whether or not God loves us while we were yet sinners or do you have can, a question I ask sometimes that gets a lot of gets me in trouble or gets the a lot of interesting questions is can you be a Christian and be wrong and then what are you allowed to be wrong about and what are you not allowed to be wrong about and unpacking that conversation does a lot of good because it allows us to expose the fact that we're probably wrong about something and that wrongness doesn't equate with God's love and goodness and forgiveness and grace and the Holy Spirit. 
for our lives. And so when God went up and sent, Jesus went up and sent his Holy Spirit down, he's here with us. He loves us and he loves the people you don't know that he loves, just like he loves you. No, but you don't always understand that when you're indoctrinated and in, inside different denominations. And so it's a long unpacking. I'm not even know if I'm okay to talk about stuff like this. It is. And, but what that does is it causes the conflicts that occur, primarily they occur within our, what we'll call our organized church circles. Because I think as humans, we like nice, neat little answers, but that's not the way things are structured. I'm in the middle of reading through the Bible and I just finished first Chronicles. I'm moving into second Chronicles. The life of David, just that microcosm of David, goodness gracious. You know, the one that was after God's heart, he, had, he to me is the focal point outside of the pointing to Jesus. He's the focal point of the Old Testament. Let's still talk about a lot of his issues because there's a lot to unpack there. I want to transition though, because the pre 19 year old Joshua, all of a sudden event and now we've got a journey that you're on after you're 19 that led quickly into those circles of organized religion, training to be in the ministry, and moving into ministry. What are you being nudged to tell us about that period or that time in your life? Well, it's appreciated, and it's valuable. And so I would definitely not be the person that I am today without all those experiences. But one of the things that I would encourage is like when I went forward to the pastor, I, I really needed to be discipled. I really was asking for someone to show me what it means to be honest, stop looking at pornography, don't do things you shouldn't be doing, how to stop having sex with your girlfriend. I just needed to know how to read the Bible. Like maybe just read with me. And that transitioning me to Bible school, I'm thankful for those experiences, but it is almost the default position inside the church culture is to send anyone who shows an aptitude to learn God's word that wanted to be discipled. I just wanted to know what it meant to be discipled. And what I would encourage is to say, what all avenues can we create inside of ministry that would produce and make disciples? Because at the end of our lives, all that really matters is being and making disciples, in my opinion. And then everything else is supposed to help us get there. And so I think we can create a lot of different intentional and organic conversations around it. Yeah. And the thing that kind of bothers me is that discipling someone is extremely time consuming, requires a lot of patience. It requires just a lot of interaction and being around someone. In many ways, this is me being a little critical of the church structure. I think we're just lazy. We don't want to spend the time. We think if someone pops in on a Wednesday night and a Sunday morning, you know, we give them a couple of verses, that's good enough. It's also one of the reasons, Josh, I'd maybe like to know your thoughts on this, that I've always been wired to coach. That's something I've always done. And I look around now and I don't think I'm elevating my profession more than I should, but I spend a lot of time with people that I coach and work with, leadership teams of businesses, and organizations, and I have in-depth communications with them kind of like this on a regular basis. As I look over the horizon, the closest thing to discipleship that I see now are some people that do what I do leadership coaching, executive coaching, because my calendar forces me to spend time with people like you that are running organizations on a regular basis. And if my heart's right, then we're discipling. So I wonder if we're just not creating the right structures to disciple people. What are your thoughts looking back on it now? Yeah. When I was chatting with the coaches at school locally, I'm like, you guys are shepherds. I used to be jealous of you. Y'all have kids for 20 hours a week and you play games. I used to think, man, I sure wish we could do something in ministry versus just have a service. And there's things to do, but it can't be at conflict with everything else that's going on in their lives. And I'm like, the amount of time that you get when you end up opening a, a business, 
And so if discipleship is best life on a life, not from a pulpit to a pew, then real life discipleship would be you walking alongside of other people, inviting them over to the home. There you're confessing your sins, your faults, you're being transparent. When you get frustrated, they see how you handle frustration and how you confess different situations. That's discipleship. And so I feel like creating a business creates opportunity to spend life on a life in making disciples. And so that's why I almost would argue that if you really wanted to make disciples, might as well plan a, a business because then you have all the opportunity in front of you to have a life on a life discipleship. Plus now you can pay your volunteers. You don't have to ask them to give up more time if they're in their week, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. So as you progressed going the traditional ministry route, at what point did you start recognizing the need to be more aggressive with business? One quick thing, my guess is that regardless of what you were doing, if it was selling drugs or selling God, you were always a pretty strong work ethic guy. Would that be a correct assumption? I would say the desire to not be poor always motivated me to hustle. And so I always worked two or three different jobs. I went to college, worked two or three different jobs while having kids. So I've always been a hustler because I always wanted to provide. And so at what point in your, you went to Bible school, starting doing ministry, you had things going on. Were you doing pressure washing on the side all along? No, I was doing Uber and Papa John's and Domino's pizza. And so I was either delivering pizzas. And this is kind of what moved to a business is I Googled top five businesses to open with 5K or less because I didn't have a lot of cash. And uh, taking pictures of cats was on the list, but also this thing called pressure washing. And so I, I had a friend that had done it. And so I went out and visited him and he made $800 in four hours. This is the most legal amount of money I had ever seen. I'm like, bro, you're the richest dude I know. I think I can open up a pressure washing company. And so I thought of what can I do to provide more value for my time? And it was opening a side business. And I didn't have all the discipleship stuff figured out. It was more organic discipleship because I all the evangelism explosion or discipleship curriculum did not teach start a business, spend time yes. with people and be yourself. Who loves right. Jesus? They didn't teach that. Sure. At, at what point, either year, time frame, or whatever, did the pressure washing company move from the side hustle to a mission, to a business's mission? Because I know mm -hmm. at some point there was probably a click or a transition or transformation or something. When was that? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's trying to put a date in a term or a definition on a time. And I don't think I knew that we were already ministers in the marketplace. We were already praying with people. We were already sharing every property manager. Every time I spoke at a real estate agent, I said, Hey, I'm going to share with you what we do. But before we do that, can I tell you a little bit about who is going to be working with you? And then I'd share a little bit of story. And that story resonated and opened up more doors. My CPA, my lawyer, the different folks, it's like they, have someone in front of them that loves him. So the date would be in the last six months. I didn't realize it was a, because I had to do work on this thing of pressure washing pastor. Last year, I asked God this question, what do you want me to do for us in my life? Do for others what I've done for you. Invite them into the marketplace to make disciples. And I was like, okay, what do I call it? He's what do people call you? I was like, they say that I'm pressure washing pastor. And then was, am I using that as a marketing tool or am I like legitimately really a pastor? So I started reading all these shepherding books. I'm like, wait a minute. Shepherding is not a pulpit. That's not shepherding. Like that's teaching. And we're called to teach and equip and, and do different things. But long story short, it wasn't until the last six months that I would say we defined it as a stamp of we are called to be and make disciples. We're going to utilize, but we had already been doing it the whole time. We just didn't know that's what we were doing. Does that make any sense? It does. I think it's almost an awareness. I believe that you were probably in that role all along, but you weren't aware of it. Would that be correct? hundred percent. That's exactly what I'm saying, because I wasn't 
I did not have the framework to connect the dots. My, my framework was the same framework as a guy at an exponential table who told me that he believes common day people can start businesses, but not pastors. And he was selling MDiv degrees. And so my framework was still somewhat, maybe he's right because he's educated and knows and he works at this school, if that makes any sense. Yeah. So one thing that's funny, I want to read this. Sometimes I'll take someone's bio and I'll pop it in chat GPT and say, I'm about to interview this guy, Joshua Brown. What are 10 questions I should ask? And this one was a funny one. It relates to what we were talking about. This is, this question is sponsored by chat GPT, by the way. And it shows the, the reason why we cannot use AI for everything. It says, ask him this question as the pastor of one of the largest pressure washing companies in Nashville, Tennessee, how do you integrate your faith and work? How does this unique role allow you to serve God and people? I think it's a great question. I don't like the preface of it because it's really marrying those things we're talking about. You are a pastor, you're a shepherd. So I guess it's maybe prophetic, but it sounds weird to ask it as the pastor of the largest pressure washing business, how do you marry your faith and your work? So I'll, this question is sponsored by chat GPT. Answer that question from her. Yeah. It's so good. And I appreciate chat doing that for me. Like that's a great question. And I'm going to start putting that more in it because in my head, I'm thinking whoever controls chat controls the world. And so we need to start programming chat as much as we can. But so this is my thought there is that when Jesus gave an example of how pastors are supposed to live their lives, he took out his outer robe, he grabbed a water basin, got on his knees and started washing his disciples' feet. He gets up from the table and he looks at him and says, do you know what I just did for you? And he says, if, you, if your Lord and master has washed your feet, you go and wash each other's feet. And I feel like if you wanna be a great pastor, you got to be a great lover and servant of people. And I think of no greater role than the role of a servant leader. And so instead of saying, hey, feed me, let me feed you. And so I love the idea of this ministry in the marketplace. So I'm taking it back to that terminology. Be a great example of a confessor and a server. And so when we talk about employees, we never use that word. It's called team members. When we talk about an org chart, I'm at the very bottom. I'm an old root. And hopefully I'm given life and support for the tree and the fruit that falls to grow and become more fruit. In a lot of ministries and a lot of businesses, the pastor and the CEO are at the top of the org chart and all their slave, all their followers and employees, I was about to say slave, I was trying to be funny, are all below them. And it's, man, we're called to die and serve and support all that are connected to us. And so that's the way that a pastor of the largest pressure washing company in the globe should answer that question. The reason that's so good, I shared this before we started recording. I just finished up doing some episodes on what I call the faith-driven leader. And in my mind, someone who is driven by their faith and they're in a leadership role, they really do not own anything very similar to Jesus, but they're a steward over those things that they have been gifted with. And I think you've been gifted with this. Have you earned a lot of it with your effort? Yeah, you have, but you've been gifted that. So you're a steward and a steward has one task. It's to take care of something and then return it in a better condition than when they received it. That's good. And that's the mindset that I just heard you say. So I'm so excited. It kind of ties in with some of the teaching we just did. It says on your site that your core values are culture, business, ministry. Here at Seek, Go, Create, we say that we redefine success in leadership, business, and ministry. So we are really meshing together well, but talk about those core values. And I've always heard it said that you need to be able to preach a sermon on your core values. So we don't quite have time for a sermon, but just give whatever makes sense of what comes to mind when I bring up your core values, culture, business, and ministry? I feel like culture is king. Culture is ultimately what other people experience when you're, when they're around you. 
And so how does my presence make someone else's presence feel? And doing great work inside of our own culture creates the opportunity to affect the culture around us. And so for me, culture is at the very top. Business, if it's not sustainable, it will die. And so you have to be smart. You have to learn from the marketplace. You've got to be, in my opinion, why not be better than any other blank out there, whether it's selling shoes or pressure washing services or doing podcasting, why not do it as good as anybody out there on it? And it's got to be sustainable through making money and providing jobs or you're going to die. And then ministry, the fruit of our businesses, in my opinion, should have some type of efforts to do for others what they could never do for you. And so one thing that we do in Nashville is we wash every widow's home. We are on a mission to wash every widow's home in Nashville for free. There's a long story there. Don't know how much time we have, but I originally said there's no way that we can wash every widow's home for free. But there was an Andy Stanley quote that said, if you do, you just because you can't do it for everybody, it doesn't mean you can't do it for somebody. So do for one what you wish you could do for everybody. And so we've started washing widows' homes in Nashville. And so that's part of our ministry inside the marketplace. Then there's other behaviors, but that's one that we can measure. That's very good because we're commanded to take care of the widows and the orphans. And I kind of love how you're bookending your life where in many ways you were adopted, you were orphaned, and obviously you've overcome that. And then now here you are in the position to minister to and do some taking care of the widows. Very cool. Now, at some point, and I think you said it's probably been recent, you've recognized that this pressure washing pastor model can be duplicated. It may not be just Nashville, Tennessee. It can be something that can be done in other places with other people. Tell me about that. Tell me about the progression that's gone on there to expand this beyond just Joshua Brown and his business. Yeah. So in prayer last year, trying to figure out, we did 1.8 last year and I'm like, okay, what's, what should we do next? And I felt like the Lord said, do for others what I've done for you. And that's where we got the pressure washing pastor conversation. And then I studied what franchising and license and met with lawyers and started looking at what all systems and what all infrastructure has to be created to do here, what do in other places, what we're doing here. And so basically we've created the infrastructure of how to come alongside of a, and whether it's a pastor, former pastor, or faith-driven entrepreneur, that's the terminology that I would use. Someone, man, who is a disciple and loves Jesus and is not afraid of connecting business and discipleship. I believe they need to be married, not divorced. And there are a lot of businesses that it is divorced. It's not married. And so we have created opportunity for other folks who are interested in opening a home service business to say, hey, come underneath our brand, come underneath our blueprint and our coaches. And so we've created the infrastructure to be able to launch other pressure washing companies in other areas and not be on an island. And when you look at ministry as a whole, a lot of times you feel like you're all alone and you have nobody to support you or to learn from or to keep you accountable. That's what the branding allows in the coaching and the blueprint of growing your own pressure washing company. Mm. If that makes it, sense. Yeah, no, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And I love it. I love that ability to scale and minister to more people. Minister to more people is what I'm hearing. But you mentioned licensing, franchising, from the legal standpoint, what is the opportunity that people have? Yeah, we have a licensing agreement that we basically go through. We weren't trying to control. We were trying to gift and create opportunity, but you have to have a legal structure in order to not get in trouble. And so we created a license agreement that basically sets forth the foundation of what it looks like to be a pressure washing pastor. You utilize the branding Browns pressure washing. And out of Nashville, if you just look up brownspressurewashing.com, you'll see that we are crushing it in the Nashville market. And in my mind, a brand has the ability to grow and bring support when you're doing it on your own or trying to figure out what's next. It's like you make so many financial mistakes and it's hard to be able to create, okay, how do I do this? What do I do here? How do we hire? How do we soft wash a house, roof wash and blah, blah. And it's like, why don't we create the whole system where we can give the playbook, give video structure, 
we even answer the phones because one thing I learned is pastors don't have time to grab their phones if they're trying to open a business. We send the phone straight to our headquarters, which creates a lighter payload and then, like as far as your payroll and gives the support to be able to get that pastor at that person's house. And so that's some of the things that we are doing. So how, give yourself a grade, how's the expansion going? We just started this year. And so we've got five locations and we're actually this week, we have a Chattanooga pressure washing pastor that's down training with the team. And we've got a Houston pressure washing pastor coming down, which we're super excited about. We've got Birmingham and we have two locations that I started that ended up crashing. And I learned a lot about those two for two first locations. And it's like, you learn more from your failures than you do successes. And we learn a lot from that situation. So three good, two, a lot of learning. That I yeah, Give us the quick tip. What's a learning point? We got a lot of business people listening in. What's something that you learned that you could share with Number us? Number one, this is an, I would say there's three points and then an action. You got to have time, money, and framework. If you don't have time, don't have money, don't have framework, very difficult to grow a business. If you make a choice to grow a business, you need to spend money on marketing. At the end of the day, if you don't invest in whatever lead generation tool that is for your business, it is very difficult. You either have to have phenomenal relationships, boots on the ground, mindset, which requires a lot of time, or you have to say, I've got X amount of dollars to invest in marketing that can generate it. And we've learned the two that shut down, they did not have the money to market. They just, and without marketing, you, you crumble. But I was trying to be super kind. I was like, hey, I'm going to teach you everything we can. I'm going to give you our branding, our blueprint, our coaches. And they did not have the resources I didn't check and say, hey, do you have money to spend on Google ads or Facebook or Bing or whatever you want to use? And they just didn't. And so if you're out there and you're struggling to grow your business, you need to figure out what people are doing. They're growing in your industry and market like they're marketing. But the thought that just came to my mind, so many people, especially people of faith, they'll say, God will just bring people to me which is correct. However, you've got to have the nets out there, right? If you have a service to offer, there's people always looking to be served. And I'm not a big faith-driven prosperity gospel where if we just speak it, it's going to happen. I think God asked us to come join with him and we have to work and till and plant. So you mentioned earlier, you used the term faith-driven entrepreneur. We've used the term faith-driven leader year mm -hmm. and you've talked, you use the term pastor, but if you were to describe the person, cause I, I actually believe that someone might be listening in right now that may think, I wonder if mm -hmm. I'm one that I need to get in touch with Joshua and I'm not, it's not a commercial or anything, but I'm just like, identify your ideal person so that if someone's sitting there thinking that they'll know if they are or not. Yeah, for me, the reason I started is because I wanted to figure out how to provide for my family. And so I feel like if you've got a fuel that feeds the fire to say when the truck goes down, when the pressure washer doesn't work, when things don't work out the way that you're going to figure out how to make it work, which is why one of the reasons I love student pastors is because they can make a lot out of a couple of twigs or a small budget or whatever it is, they get things done. So I, I feel like the mindset of someone that says, I'm going to make this happen. And it, it just, you're going to figure it out as you go. And someone that's not willing to quit and give up and be humble, honest, and hardworking, that's the characteristics that, that we promote is if you're humble, if you're honest, and you're a hard worker, those are the key fundamental components in order to be the right person to grow a pressure washing company. You need to be in a city that is growing. If everyone's moving away from your city, it might not be a good a choice to try to open up a business because people are going to be holding on to their money. Find the cities that people are moving to and open up a business there. It'll create more opportunities to provide for other people in your family. That's good. So how can people connect with you if they want more or just they resonated with your story, your background? How would you like people to connect with you? We'll include yeah, it in can, the notes. We'll include it in the notes, by the way. 
Yeah, it's pressurewashingpastor.com. You can read a little bit there, and also you can scan a QR code or click a button and schedule a meeting with me. I've got two hopes out of doing these podcasts, and that's to do more podcasts where I can share my story, what God's done for me, and then also see whether or not you'd be a good partner to launch a pressure washing company inside your city. Uh, I love the pressurewashingpastor.com. Did you have a challenge getting that domain, or was it wide open? Yeah, go to GoDaddy. I'm like, it's open. Let's go. So anytime you hit one that's available, you get a happy end. So I was very thankful that pressure washing pastor wasn't taken. So they weren't sending you to dot info or anything like that. That's really good. Anything else? I've got one final question, but Joshua, anything else on your heart right now? I know you're a man that's moved by the Holy Mm -hmm. Spirit and all. Anything else that you just feel compelled Mm -hmm. to share before we wrap up with one last question? I'd say significance, identity would be something that's in, within my own heart today is that you are perfectly and complete and lacking nothing or with or without a pressure washing company or whatever you're doing. So if your listeners are here today, I believe completion is not required. That I, I feel like to accomplish something doesn't mean now you're complete and whole based on what God has already done for you. I feel like if we more if we walk into the fact that God loves us, base nothing on what we have done, but just the fact of his favor and his goodness and his kindness, and we're not trying to accomplish anything for him, but just trying to live in light of what he's done for us. I feel like just walk in wholeness, be free today. Significance and value is found at the foot of the cross. It's a great place to live. What a great way to wrap. A great conversation. Thank you, Joshua. My final question. We are seek, go, create three words that obviously mean a lot to me that we share with the audience. I'm going to let you pick one of those words over the other two that resonates. Tell me which word and why. That's my last question. Do you know how hard this question is? I almost want to ask Maybe. I don't know. Favorite. Yeah, I want to find out which one your favorite, but I would say create. I would say create, and I love go. It was a strong tie between go and create. But if I could invite your listeners or myself to be thinking, it's like, how do I create value inside the world? How do I make a difference? And so if I were to pick out a word, I say, go create something glorious in the name of God in his glory. And just, man, don't sit on your hands. Go create something beautiful for the glory of God. That's what I would say. That's cool. Just to give you a little clue for me, they are in the order that the Lord gave them to me in a very significant time that I was forced to seek first and then go and create because I had been in the mode of creating. And anyway, what's beautiful is that right now you've got a business model that you are in the mode, in the mode of creating and growing. So I also think that create, it makes total sense. That would be what resonates with you more than anything else. Joshua Brown, thank you so much. This has been so good. I knew that it would be. I'm going to ask a big favor for those listening in. There's somewhat, there's either a pastor or someone looking to do something, looking for the hustle or something. They meet that criteria that Joshua mentioned. There's someone that needs to hear this message or someone that may have been had the upbringing that Joshua had. I'm going to ask you to take a screenshot or if you're on a player or listening or watching on YouTube, share it with them right now. Don't wait. Share it right now. This is something that someone needs to hear. This message will minister to them. And quite honestly, I believe that you needed to hear it too. I know that I did. So I appreciate it. Make sure you're subscribed and following us on all the platforms. Leave reviews if you haven't done that yet. And until next time, we have new episodes every Monday. Until next time, continue being all that you were created to be.